Do you know any more knock-knock jokes? Uh, hmm. Would you like a good Irish knock-knock joke? Then? An Irish one? An Irish one, yes, yes. Knock-knock. Uh, Who's there? Elvis. Elvis who? Uh, Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> That's absurd, isn't it? Ah, there's no putting nothing over on me, you know. I know them film stars. Them <laughs> film stars. Do you ever use your voice to uh, to baffle people, like on the telephone or or in restaurants to get tables and this sort of thing? Um, I don't use it to baffle people, really, except that if I get a bit uptight with some loonies or nutters who are around, you know. Mm. Uh, as for restaurants, uh, I usually phone up and... Uh, you know, if there's somebody there, say, hello, have you got a table, this, that, and the other. But if I'm in a crowd of people, I usually blend into them by using, uh, you know, various accents, whatever the sound is at the particular part. Sort of suit, suit the occasion. Suit the occasion, you know, yes. like, yeah. Yes, yes. smashing. Mm. When, in fact, you, you came from a, a really incredible line of, of uh, theatrical people, didn't you? See, my mum very much wanted me to go into the theatre and continue, because my grandma was in the theatre as well, right. you see. Mm -hmm. The whole family were. Right. And um, I got a job in an uncle's theatre at Ilfracombe. My mother used to say, that I should never ask, anybody in the theatre should never ask another person to do a job they couldn't do themselves, you yeah. see. So I was apprentice sweeping out after the, each performance. That was the first job, I had a ten bob a week. And then after that I used to take tickets on the door. Then I did front of house, which is, as most people know, just box office. Right. And then from box office, I went to assistant stage manager, front of house, lights, assistant stage manager, stage manager. And uh, gradually progressed my way up to playing small parts like your carriages without, uh, things like that, or hello, or something like this, you know, minor, niddly, tiddly poo things. Mm. And um, I saw some very famous actors actually come to that theatre. Paul Schofield was one in uh, Night Must Fall years and years ago right. with Mary Claire. Yeah. And so really that was the first time um, but later, before that, I used to travel around with my mother and father and uh, all over the country when I was a kid. What kind of an act did they do, Peter? What did, what did Mum do? Well, Mum used to pose before... Uh, she used to ha see... Uh, was it, supposing this was a big screen, you see? Yeah. Projection screen. Mum used to stand there in white tights thing. It was a real daring thing then, you see. <laughs> And uh, they used to project slides onto Mum, and she would depict, you know, various famous characters from history, you see, as the slides changed. And um, my dad would be playing the old Joanna in the front there, or something like that. Yeah. Or she might be taking a... She was a character actor. She used to take part in sketches and things like that. Yes. Yeah. And Dad... Uh, my grandmother, as a matter of fact, was the very first one to ever put a water show uh, on tour. She had a invented a German, a German inventor, invented an enormous water tank, filled the stage, eventually drowned the band in one, because uh, <laughs> it broke. And Huddersfield, I think it was. Yeah, I mean, several of them were drowned, seriously drowned. <laughs> seriously drowned. How can you be unserious with that? Yes, yes, that's a thought. <laughs> now, <laughs> anyway, you know, oh, 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 you're trying to get air through a trombone. You know? <laughs> and, um, these girls used to uh, uh, dive into the tank and do all kinds, very daring then in bathing costumes, you know. Mm. And the shows were called Splash Me and Have a Dip and whatnot. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you, I mean, you remember that very clearly, do you, that, that, that part of your, yes. your life? Yes, mm. I, I remember that very well. Mm. Um, I mean, what else do you recall from those days? Because you were brought up through, uh, what, I suppose, like digs and a succession of music halls and this sort of thing. What do you remember particularly from that period? Well, Mike, you know, I, I really didn't like that period of my life as a kid. I didn't like the touring. I didn't like the smell of grease paint. It used to hit you when you went into a, any stage door. The sort of the smell of size, that's the stuff they paint on scenery, you know. And grease paint and baritones with beer on their breath and makeup on their collar. Always deep voices. Hello, little sonny. How are you, boy? All right, little boy, dear little boy. Who is he? Who is he? <laughs> and, uh, I used to spend my time sitting in dressing rooms and whatnot, and so I didn't like that. This is probably why I hated being in the theatre. You know? Really? Yeah. It's amazing that you're having... All connected with it. Yes, and having hated that, that in fact you became involved in it. 
But, but before we go on to that, what, what other acts do you remember around at that, that time? Because that was a very rich period in Music Hall, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I remember Artemis and his boys. <laughs> Artemis and his boys. Who were recruited from the local, you know. That was a fellow who did a sort of Will Hay act. And I remember Fred Roper's midgets. Fred Roper's midgets. <laughs> midgets, yes. <laughs> Now, Fred Roper's midgets were a lot of little men and little ladies and little men. You see, all about this size. And they used to do various tricks, like jumping through hoops and things, like dog acts and things. But, I mean, this Fred Roper used to hold a thing and a midget would jump through. Now, these midgets were about this size, and I could never figure out why. They were the same size as me, but I couldn't sort of make any contact with them. So they had deep voices and spoke cigars and pipes, you see. Yeah. Yeah. And they were funny, they used to go, they used to go <laughs> I mean, I mustn't, I'm not being a downer on gnomes or dwarfs or midgets or anything, and I know they're all very different. But it did strike me very strangely at, the, uh, at that particular time to see a mass of them. You know, they used to come out of the stage all en masse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I never heard what happened to Fred Roper and his midgets, but uh, you do see them from time to time, of course, in circus. You see yeah. a lot of midgets in circus. It's amazing they should be called Fred, because Fred's your favourite name, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, Why is Fred funny? I don't know. I think it seems to ruin anything, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's like Fred, Sid, Bert, Tom. I mean, Millie and I have and thinking, we've always had a thing about Sid, Tom, Bert and Jim. I mean, like, if you said Fred, this is, this, this is a genuine Fred Rembrandt. No, I mean... <laughs> 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 and the fellow says, it's not, it's not a, a Rembrandt. And he said, no, 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 but it's Fred Rembrandt. <laughs> it may have been a Sid, I'm not sure. But you see, uh, if you put that sort of thing in front, it sort of ruins it in yes. a way. You know? I rather like that. I, that's how our shows used to be, were called the Fred shows and things. Yes. Like and then we, it made Fred our patron saint, really. Yeah. You became, in fact, of course, first of all, before you became an actor, you became a musician, didn't you? You were a, a drummer. Of some of some note. Oh, mm -hmm. you remember that? Yes, yes, yes I remember yes. that. What, in fact, um, made you give up music? I mean, why did you decide to jack that in and, and go finally onto stage? Well, a couple of reasons. One, I told you last time. You did indeed. Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is that it's a very dreary business being a drummer or any musician doing gigs really around the country, right. or in one set place because you get a lot of Hooray Harrys who come up to you and ask you for songs, to play songs for them. I mean, a typical musician's story, and this is probably true, it's probably based on fact, is about a fellow who came up to a very well-known friend of ours, uh, Alan Clare, mm. pianist. Well, I was pianist, yeah. And said, I say, would you play uh, uh, That's What You Are? So Alan said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what, that's what you are. I haven't, I, I'll have a look through the book. So he had a look through the book very quickly. And this chap was all dancing around the beard for a girl. Don't write there. And, um, take the thing. and he came back and he said, I say, there's a drinky poo in it for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he came back <laughs> and he said, piano player, piano player. <laughs> And kettle drummer. I was known as a kettle drummer. <laughs> I don't know why. You never used to play a kettle, but it, <laughs> it comes from timpani, you see. And he said, aren't you going to play um, that, That's What You Are? So Alan said, I'd love to play That's What You Are, but I don't know how it goes. He said, good God. He said, what is the country coming to? He said, I, I never thought I'd reach the day when somebody didn't know That's What You Are. He said, well, if you sing it, I'll try. He said, it goes like this. Unforgettable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't win if you win. That's, that's a great musician story. <laughs> it's it's the marvelous, yeah. yeah. Unforgettable. <laughs> that's what you are. I mean, you're, you're, you, you learnt um, music from your father, didn't you? A lot of uh, stuff you learnt in the, in the early days. <coughs> yes, Dad was uh, convinced always I was going to be a road sweeper, you see. And he always <laughs> told me, very encouraging with Dad, you see. Yeah. So you turn out to be a bloody road sweeper, will you? I'll tell you that. Is he auction? Yeah. Uh, lovely. Ah, uh, you right, bloody auction. <laughs> when Dad was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write bloody auction. <laughs> But I'll tell you why. Um, when, when I first went up to Bingley in Yorkshire, where Dad's people came from, 
my granddad said he'd heard that my dad had been appearing at the Alhambra. Dad used to be the organist at Bradford Cathedral, you see. A young lad, you see. And to be in that in a stage business, you know, was all sort of sinful in a way, because they were farmers and whatnot, you know. And he said, I hear our Willie's appealing to tell Umbra. Someone said, aye. <laughs> he said, uh, I'll have to burn down an arcan unto him. <laughs> I need subtitles for this one. Yeah. <laughs> And if we arrived on the two o'clock train, he'd like to make sure we got away on the five. He says, a good train going at five, aren't <laughs> we? were never made very welcome in those yeah. days, aren't we? It was very welcome indeed. It was <laughs> yeah. a nice homely place to yeah. be. Can you remember a, a song that, that Dad taught you from, from those days? In fact, I know you can, because in fact you used a song in a film you did called The Optimist, didn't you? That your dad had, uh, had taught you. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, matter of fact, when Dad taught me to... Um, Did it get this old burst on the old banjo? Burst on the banjo. Right. When Dad... Um, my dog has fleas. Oh, that's right. Oh, he's teaching me to play the uh, banjo. Legend had it that he taught George Formby. I don't know whether he ever did, actually, but he used to boast about it. Anyway, he probably did, actually, because he was quite good on guitar and whatnot. You sing a little song. It's sort of very dated now, but it's quite, you know, a sweet little thing, really. Mm. I've got an idea, soon she'll be cooking my breakfast. Wait and see. I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. Saturday night on her city. Oh, what a time there's going to be. I haven't told her. Hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. She still calls me Mister, but she won't. I know she won't. After I've kissed her, I've got an idea. Soon there'll be one little, two little, possibly three. I haven't told her. Hasn't told me, but I know it just the same. <laughs> There's nothing like a good drop of water. <laughs> Particularly if you put it in the glass. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. If, when you were... Uh, <laughs> I'm not you... a weight watcher, I... No. no. <laughs> uh, it sounds like workers' playtime. <laughs> <laughs> it's Harry Foreman in the house. Whoa, whoa, oh, good old Harry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> when we used to go and work his playtime years ago, a fellow used to come around. I say, listen, if you couldn't mention the former's name, uh, Bert Thung, uh, <laughs> it's, it's about to get a laugh. Bert Thung, yeah, I'll try and get that into the script. Okay, right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be up here at the Spirella Corset Factory um, <laughs> to welcome Bert Thung. <laughs> That was the best part of the act, you see. <laughs> and Bill Gates used to book me just on Bert Thumbs and people like that. <laughs> when you, when you sat, you, about that time, you were talking about uh, a, a, a period when you were uh, appearing um, on stage and also on, on radio. First of all, in those days you used to do impersonations, didn't you? That was what you based your act on. Yeah. 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 What, do, what, what kind of impersonations did you do? Well, I used to do as they say, stars of, sta stars of stage, screen and radio. <laughs> I used to do, I used to do Peter Lorre from the Morty's Fork and you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to do Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. My God, sir, you are a card. You really are a card. <laughs> Stop twisting my arm, you're hitting my arm. You're hurting me. <laughs> so a selection of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Tommy Hanley. Well, isn't that nice? What is it? <laughs> it's me largest leavings. <laughs> well, I'll go to the foot of our set. TTFN. What does that mean? He said, Tata for now. No, she said, Whitey, Whitey K. What's that? She said, You're too young to know. <laughs> oh, masses of bits like that, you know, used to do. Any classical actors, anything like that? Ah. Yes, I used to do. Oh, yes, I used to do one. Uh, when uh, Larry Olivier came out with um, Richard III. Oh, yes. After the standing up, all oh, right. Please do. Yeah. This is a posh bit, so no laughing. I was going to do this at the Mermaid, you know, Mike. Yeah. But I got cold feet when the opening of the Mermaid, when Bernard was opening the Mermaid. 
because I saw the film and I thought, that's it, he's done the lot, you know, and you can't really follow that, can you, you know? <laughs> right, here we go. Now it's the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war has smoothed his wrinkled front. And now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nibbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sporty tricks. <laughs> Shakespeare. <laughs> Nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion. Cheated off feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, in this weak piping time of peace, I find no desire to while away the time and descant on my known deformity. Ta da! <laughs> And you were going to do that uh, straight out, you man. You were going to do the R Richard III. No, I was going to do Richard III, yes. Really? I might even do it now because it's a long time passed since then, but uh, I don't know, you know. I think that was a definitive one. Of course, you know, all the great classical parts are original interpretations of over the years, but I, I, I love old actors, you know. I don't mean to say that Olivia's an old actor. No. Would you like to hear an old actor's story? Oh, I'd love to hear an old actor's story. I love old actor's stories. I'm a, I'm a right sucker for all that. Me too. Right. It's a good one. I don't really tell many stories because uh, I can't. Be. I'm not very good at telling stories. But anyway, this is a story about an old boy who's on tour. He's well past it. And he's on tour up north with a show. And he decides to go into a pub for a drink that morning. And he goes into the pub and he says to the landlord, he said, good morning, landlord. My name is Warrington Minge. I am appearing in the new play at the Hippodrome, Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering if you could oblige me. I'll have a large Remy Martin, please, by cashing this small check. He said, I'm sorry, sir, have you not, have you not seen the notice? He said, what notice are you referring to? No checks cashed for theatrical. Ah, no, he said, I didn't notice it. I must admit, no, no. Make that uh, a lemonade shandy. I'll have a lemonade shandy, I think, and uh, I'll call back for the Remy Martin. So he goes out of the pub, into the butcher shop down the road. He said, good afternoon, Master Butcher. What a fine hygienic establishment you have here. All meat under cover, free from contamination by flies and other pests. <laughs> My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing at the Theatre Royal in a new play entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me with a few chops and a little dibber or something like that. I, this small check I have here, by cashing this... He said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you see, I'm not the owner here, but... Uh, the owner was once taken on very badly by a theatrical. He said, no, don't bother to go into it. No, no, it's all right, no. If you can prepare a lean chopper, I'll call back for it later. He tries about five other shops, ending up at a Chinese laundry at the end of the street. Goes into the Chinese laundry, and they come up. <laughs> he said, what a fine race of people, the Chinese. <laughs> Many years I spent in your fine country in repertory in Singapore, I remember, yes. My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing in a new play at the Theatre Royal entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me by... cashing this small check. He said, oh, so sorry, sir. We now I cash check for theatricals. He said, then would you mind pressing the bloody thing? <laughs> oh, I love that Chinese accent. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, tell me. <laughs> it was a goon show once we did Ah Pong, you remember? Ah Pong, yeah. I saw an Arpong in Los Angeles. Arpong, where are you, Arpong? Yeah, we are Pong till 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the street of a thousand dustbins. That was a. 
In the China story. <laughs> Good luck, Milligan Seacombe. Where are you, folks? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Tell me how you were talking about Milligan Seacombe, and, and which leads us naturally onto the goons. How, in fact, did you get your job on, on, on the BBC? Because I believe you used some subterfuge there, didn't you? Not to say some conning with your, with your voices. <laughs> Yes, actually, I was pissed off. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, I was <laughs> fed up. Fed up, right. <laughs> With, uh, I was getting nowhere fast, you know. And I noticed that Roy Spear was doing a show at the time called Sh Showtime, yes. And the compere was Dick Bentley. And there were lots of new acts, you see. And I'd written in, I don't know how many times, to try and get on the show, no reply. The secretary said, to Mr. Spear, blah, 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 blah. I've got nothing to lose. I thought, well, I'll phone up. So I used to, we were doing these impersonations, and one of the big shows on the air was Much Binding in the Marsh with Kenneth Horne and right. Dickie Murdoch. Right. And I, I, I just thought I'd do it. You know, you do things at certain times in your life. You've got to get ahead. You've got to get ahead. You know, you've got to... So I thought, if I stay here, I'm dead, you know. Uh, even if he kicks my ass out of there, it doesn't matter, as long as I, I make some impression. Right. So I phoned up and I thought, being a senior producer, Spear would probably know Horn and Murdoch, you see, who mm. were very big then. And I, I thought, if I click with the secretary, I'll get through, right? So I said, oh, um, hello, um, this is uh, Ken Horn. There's is Roy there. Now, once she said, oh, yes, she is uh, Kenneth, I, I knew I was right. So, so got on there. Roy said, hello, Ken, how are you? He said, I, I said, listen, uh, Roy, I'm phoning up because I know that new show you've got on, um, what is it, uh, Showtime or something. Dickie and I were at a cabaret the other night, saw an amazing young fellow called Peter, Peter what was his name? He said Peter Sellers. I said, oh, Peter Sellers. Uh, Sellers, Sellers, uh, Sellers. Uh, anyway, I think it'd be very good if you had, probably had him in the show, you know, or something like that. Just a little tip, little tip. We'd just go around looking, you know. He said, well, that's very nice of you, you know. And then it came to the crunch, and I said, uh, I, uh, it, it's me. He said, what? I said, it's me, Peter Sellers, talking, and it's the only way I could get to you. And would you give me a date on your show? And he said, you cheeky young sod, he said. <laughs> he said, what do you do? I said, well, obviously do impersonations. <laughs> <laughs> I was 22 at the time. Yeah. Um, it's very good. Um, and anyway, I went up there and I got a date on the spot and I got into, I got a good write-up, first write-up I've ever had in my life, yeah. you know. It's really nice. Was, film, was getting into films as easy as that, Peter, or...? or, or no, or, films, was, uh, films were a, a sort of um, closed shop. I always dreamed about being... I never really wanted to do much in the theatre, the legit theatre, as it's known among some uh, circles, um, or... I, I really wanted to... You see, I've been a great film fan all my life. Mm. I mean, I, I carry... I mean, I literally... Whenever I go to America, I carry an autograph book around with me. And I never say it's not for me, it's for my sister, you know. I always say it's for me, would you sign that? Because I really do. You see some incredible people there. I mean, marvellous people. I mean, some I know now over the years. But others I... You know, like when I first met Walter Pidgeon or William Powell. I mean, I thought, God almighty, William Powell. I've sat there and watched him for years, yeah. you know. And, I mean, it's ridiculous to ask for an autograph, except that, you know, you, you feel like you're compelled to, you know. Yes. You want to. Yes. I wanted to get so much... In. I mean, I, I know I'm a real movie buff. I can, I, you know, I can really talk about all the old movies and everything, and the new ones as well. Yeah. And I wanted to be a movie actor, mainly because I knew that in the theatre I couldn't survive very well on repetition. Because, you know, if, you, if you're lucky, you get into a long run. And then you're dead. At least I would be. In the old days, it would have been a six, seven month, eight, nine, nine years run. Now, thanks to Bernard and one or two other places, you can do six weeks. Yes. And that's the end of it, you know, yes. which is great. Yes. Well, let's, let's, let's have a look at something from the <clears throat> very start of your film career, which was, in fact, it wasn't the first film you made, but certainly it was the first film that, that, uh, that won any kind of critical acclaim for you. And that's I'm All Right, Jack. And if we could look at it now, it's in, of course, in which you created one of your uh, most memorable characters, who was the union leader, Mr. Kite. Hey, I look, told you, he's come to collect. All in the church lads brigade. Hold on. Thank you, brother. Right, brothers, have we all gathered? My purpose in convening you is to lay before you certain facts. A few minutes ago, I was handed this paper by a representative of the management. It purports to contain certain timings made by the management, 
which directly affect the rates for the job that you're doing. Now, this is the first time that this has been mooted to the Works Committee, and everything about it constitutes quite definitely, quite definitely, a definite breach of the existing agreements that exist between management and unions. A diabolical liberty. Yeah. Yeah. How could they have retimed the job without any one of us knowing? Correct, brother. And that brings me to a point that has led us to take a particularly grave view of the matter in hand. My information is that one of our members did, in fact, cooperate with the management. Brother Windrush, I'm obliged to put to you an open question. Did you or did you not, in fact, collaborate with the management? Me? Collaborate? What do you mean? Was you on loadings yesterday afternoon? Yes. <coughs> Brother Jackson, you're in charge of loadings. Where was you? Between the hours referred to, I was at a shop steward's meeting. So you were there alone, brother? Yes, I was. Except for the other chap. The other chap? <laughs> I think you ought to know, brothers, that this so-called other chap was, in point of fact, the new time and motion man. That's mm -hmm. torn. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, hope so, be. Mm -hmm. Brother Windrush, perhaps you'd care to make a statement about that? I'm terribly sorry, but he didn't tell me that. He just said that he was new here. You must be dead stupid. Should have called you. It was just that he was so interested in the truck. Oh, well, all he's interested in is more work for less money. But I wasn't working particularly hard, and I got the job done in half the time. Well, at that rate, he'd only need half the drivers. Oh, you want your head seen, too? It's all right for you, matey. We need the money. So do I. In fact, I could do with a bit more. <laughs> You're going the right bleeding way about getting it, no mistake. You silly c c c c clot. Say that again. Order, brother's order. Windrush, your case will come up tonight before the branch for consideration. Well, I would like to make it clear that I was not working hard. Just quicker. Looking at these schedules here, I'd say you was working like a ruddy black. Here, that's it. You all heard what was said in the speech about working with coloured labour. The next thing you know, we'll have the blacks here doing our jobs like they do on the buses in Birmingham. Don't you want the trick? Typical. What are you going to do, Katie? Call the drivers out. Call the drivers out. I tell you, brothers, everybody's coming out. Yeah. That was the, the, the film that, that sort of, you know, started you basically on your, on your film career. Was it not? I mean, that was the one that got you the first notices and things. Yes, uh, I'd done the Lady Killers before that, That's but right. um, didn't really get anywhere with that. Uh, fairly small role, you know, and whatnot. I wasn't very good. Anyway, this bit came up, you know, the uh, Amorite Jack. And uh, I really got away with that one. Yeah. Mm. But the thing, of course, that was happening to you <clears throat> before then, of course, it was probably one of the most significant things I know to you in your career, and that was the goons. Uh -huh. Which I know that, I mean, wasn't just a passing phase in your career, it's something that you still very much adore. In fact, you look back on it with tremendous fondness and things like it's that. the happiest time in my life, yes. actually, professionally in my life. Yes, I can, that, I can believe that too. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you, you, you've developed in that time a very special relationship too, didn't you, with, with Harry and, and, and with Spike? Yes, we work like one person. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but the, the relationship with Spike is a, is a very, um, what's the word, fruitful one for sort of practical jokes and things, isn't it? I mean, you get up to all kinds of tricks. And things. Yes, uh, we still do it to this very day. Um, uh, once when we were living in uh, uh, West, uh, in um, Shepherd's Hill in Highgate, in the same block of flats, it was Elf Marks living upstairs, Spike and I. And uh, I just got married, and Spike had just got married. And I was going away, and I'd had installed in my flat a new alarm called Burgo. Burgo, folks. <laughs> B B Y G O T, not Burgot, but Burgo. Burglars go, it means. <laughs> and there are personal attack buttons, and if, if a burglar sort of breathes outside your front door and goes, ah, he's arrested immediately. <laughs> or if he puts a foot in your flat, he's also. And then if he gets in the flat by not coughing or treading on anything, there's a personal attack button. Milligan said, could he stay in my flat? He had a Barney with his wife at that particular time. And I said, great, I was going away, see with Anne. And, um, so, anyway, above the bed was one of these sort of pear-shaped switches that you normally switch off the light, you know, the thing. But in fact, it was, a, it was a, a, a personal attack button. And old Milligan at that time was going through a, through a bad period and got a long grey and white and green beard and whatnot. <laughs> and red eyes. And I don't know what was going on. But he pressed this thing in the middle of the night and 15 drum, drunken coppers. <laughs> 
knocking at the front and back door. When he opened the door, they went, Oh, you bastard! Come here! <laughs> and they, ch they, they knocked the hell out of Milligan. He said, I tell you, I just meet friend Peter Sellers lent me this place. Ah, we've heard all about that. Come on, now it's come. Because see, what happens is when you press the thing, a recording goes out and goes straight through. It says, Oh, there's a personal attack happening, you know, in the flat. And Milligan was there, he was taken to the police station. <laughs> And I got a call up in Birmingham to say that, from him, say, will you tell him that I was sleeping in your flat and I wanted to switch the light on. <laughs> <laughs> you know. In fact, you, you brought out this, uh, this book, which is the, the Book of the Goons, which in fact is the third... Uh, yeah, this is the third one. This is the final one, I expect. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And there's, there's one marvellous thing in here, which was I was going to ask you about um, mm. the goon voices and where they came from and this sort of thing. And in fact, in the book itself, we've got this marvellous little section, which I can find here, I think, which in fact is a, a sort of glossary, it's called, which lists all the voices and, um, oh, yeah. and tells you, and defines them. It was quite, uh, could, could you in fact go through the ones that, that you yourself were involved with? Well, I have to tell you about them all, but I'll give you sure. very quickly. Jim Spriggs, a kind of strangulated voice that Spike used, pronounced Jim. He was a hello, Jim. Hello, Jim. What it was, Spike used to sort of pronounce these words in the, ma C, uh, in the key of C major. Hello, Jim. Hello, 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 hello. Little Jim, <laughs> a high-pitched child played by Spike who lives in Eccles' boot. Hello, you remember Spike? Hello, 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 hello. And he's thought to be his nephew. He points out when people, he used to say, He's falling in the water. <laughs> when Spike and uh, Eccles and Blue Bottle used to have a scene, I get that, What did he say, little Jim? Spike. And he said, He's falling in the water. <laughs> Twit, Ernie Splut Muscle. I don't remember that one. <laughs> a Swede, Swede, a very rustic voice based on a character who Peter met in Sussex, the home of producer Peter Eaton. Now I remember that. Oh, big right now is. Peter Eaton said he was talking in a field with one of these fellows, and he don't voice more. And a whacking great Boeing went across and drowned out everything they said, you see. <laughs> And after it had gone away and all sound had gone, this fellow says, I don't like all that bloody tackle up there. <laughs> <laughs> now, he'd reduced years of research and everything <laughs> into one word. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I don't like that tackle, no. <laughs> <laughs> Geraldo, well, we all remember dear old Geraldo. Yeah. Uh, that was a sort of voice. He's, hello again, we're on the radio again. Yeah. Based on the late Bandley's voice, yes. Flower Dew, a camp voice used by Peter and Spike. This is based on a couple of poofs we knew at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, big one, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, you know, so. Called Flower and Dew. Right? Flower and Dew. Mm -hmm. uh, who were, uh, who'd gone to church for the first, uh, one had gone to church for the first time. I said, you must come to church. I said, oh, I can't. Oh, so, yes, I must, you know. So, so, no. And we come to the full ceremony, you know. So we go in, they said, well, I don't know what to do. He said, don't worry about it, you know. So I know the whole thing, you know. They said, when the priest came in uh, with a, you know, incense and he was waving around, all the smoke was coming out. He said, oh, all of the good fun, all of the good And they were walking down the aisle, the priest was walking down the aisle with the choir boys. And this other one, who didn't know much about it, rushed up to the priest, grabbed his arm, and he said, I say, do you realize your handbag's on fire? <laughs> Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> I should be banned from everything soon. Yeah. <laughs> banned from the East Finchley Boy Scouts Club. <laughs> Terrible. Singe's Lalkaka. Singe's Thing. Singe's Thing. That's what I like. Singe's Thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and Bobby Banerjee. <laughs> Two Hindus played by Peter and Spike. Well, now, Spike was born in India, as you know, and I spent about three years out there, so we both, you know, knew the Indian sound, you know, the old, what's the name, the, 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 it used to be called the, um, um, you know, I can't think what it was, anyway. Um, and we 
we started to bring this sound back. Now, a lot of people came back from India at that time and suddenly knew the sound very well, but couldn't, you know, they hadn't heard anybody. No, no, please, Bertie. So that was that. <laughs> I mean, that was that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, they became incredibly popular, those two. <clears throat> and all kinds of things happened after that, you know. You have no idea. I was invited to speak at the, uh, uh, at the Oxford Union, the Indian Society, once. And, uh, and the very kind gentleman who introduced me said that I'd, uh, 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 it was due, uh, due to me that, uh, that uh, members of uh, the uh, Indian race were allowed to get past the garden fence with their carpets. Um, <laughs> said it, because people sounded like Spike and I. They said, Fred Bogg, it said, a cockney idiot played by Harry. Now, I can't remember Harry doing this. He used to, Harry used to do quite a few voices. I can't remember, I can't remember the Fre Fred Bogg voice. I can't remember that one. Benteen, a prof professorial voice based on Michael Benteen's uh, Professor Osric Pureheart. Mike had a wonderful character in the early days. Uh, called Osric Pureheart in the original Goon Show. Cyril, a friend of Spike and Peter. Cyril Waterman was a chap who used to live in these flats, you know? And Cyril was the sort of fellow who had to do something before you had done it. Now, if we'd been to the Palladium to see a top of the bill and we saw, say, he said, we saw Sid Nurge last week, Cyril. He said, I've seen him, I've seen him, I've seen him! <laughs> so I said, he's only open last night. He said, I oh, know, I've seen him, I've seen him! <laughs> He went to the south of France, I tell you a terrible thing, he went to the south of France and he said, who do you think I saw in the south of France? So I said, I don't know, he said, Don Andrews, Don Andrews! <laughs> and then he said, he's a confirmed alcoholic, confirmed alcoholic! <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he never met Don, how, I mean, I don't know how he knew, I mean, probably Don Andrews never had a drink in his life. Absolutely, I'm sure not. That was the in thing to know about yeah. see, Cyril. I've seen him, I've seen him. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder if he's listening to that. It would be funny. L listening? What am I talking about? Radio. It's television. Uh, Hearn Salesman. Ernest Hearn, a solemn, humorless American announcer. Voice used by me. Yes, I used to do that. I used to say, well, I'm um, on the Harford. We used to use the sounds, American sounds. We didn't use words. This is the American bar of the Harn bar of the Lions on the Harn. Now, Harn bar of the Harn. You can do that with most uh, sounds. You can do it with the English sounds, and you can do it with French sounds. The music of the voice, that's yes. all that counts. Yes. Levis, a voice used by Harry based on Carol Levis, or Warrell Crevis, as he was known in those days. <laughs> well, I can't remember that. Anyway, um, African chief used or based on Big Chief Ellinger Ray Ellington. Bim bum bala boo. He was always chasing blood knock for, you know, very sort of naughty reasons, you know. He said, don't come in, don't come in, Ellinger. Don't come in. If me won't come in, make you prisoner, blood knock. Ah! <laughs> come inside, come inside. Me come in. And then as soon as he got in, blood knock would rush out the door and nail it up. <laughs> <laughs> Huey Green. Well, this is Huey Green, yes. Yeah. Izzy, one of Harry's voice based on Jewish comedian Izzy Bond. You know that one. I can't do that one. Dimbleby, a commentator voice. Harry had a lot of voices, you know. A lot of people think he did just Ned of Wales. He did loads of voices. Dimbleby, a commentator type voice used by Peter based on Richard Dimbleby's. I used to do a thing at that time and say, well, here we are. Uh, here I am on the top of Nelson's column, waiting now for the great parade to start. Any moment, the Duchess of Boyle de Spudswell will be arriving, <laughs> and the great microphone of state is being wheeled in for the Duchess's speech. To my right, the household cavalry, so-called because each member is a householder, uh, <laughs> snorting at the rain and lifting the thigh and dust as they pass the base of Nelson's saluting column. Nelson, who so nobly won the victory at Balaclava. Um, <laughs> you get it all wrong. <laughs> you see. And then we, uh, okay. When you work with somebody like Spike on, on a film or whatever, you've got a reputation of being a, a hell of a giggler, haven't you? I mean, you, you cops on set and this sort of thing. Do, do you have that problem with with Spike at all? Uh, yes, but we usually laugh before it happens, somehow or other. Uh, on other occasion, I normally laugh when it happens for some reason. I mean, uh, I mean, we usually get all the kicks we want to out of something like that. I mean, imagine, I mean, we just take the British Army standard advertisement. 
travel to far distant exotic places, meet interesting people, and then kill them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's a phased our start, you see. Yeah. So we use that in that. Yeah. Uh, so we got our giggles out of that or whatever it was. Other times, you know, um, I don't know, it's when the laughter gets over you or takes you over. Yes. You know? well, do all the other great gigglers, Peter, that, that, that you know about? You probably uh, all know. Well, there's a lot of them in the business. O'Toole, uh, you know, Peter O'Toole is a, a notorious giggler. He, um, he, oh, yes, he taught, he, he, <laughs> uh, when he was making Lawrence of Arabia, do you ever remember the scene in Lawrence of Arabia where King Faisal, played by Alec Guinness, welcomed Peter O'Toole and Anthony Quayle into his tent to listen to a passage read from the Quran? They'd ridden through the desert. Now, O'Toole uh, usually likes to have, or used to like to have anyway, you know, a bit of the old shampoo in the morning <laughs> and to sort of warm up. And Anthony Quayle is pretty straight-faced. Actually, he was once described, obviously very wrongly, by um, uh, John Gielgud as having a face like two tins of condemned veal. <laughs> um, which is a rather cruel way, but I mean, you know what I mean? It's a sort of uh, uh, image. And he, uh, he never broke up, you see, but O'Toole was breaking up con uh, continuously. And the problem was this. As they came into the tent, Guinness would say, and David Lean's a stickler for reality, you know? And they were filming in the middle of the desert. Now, believe it or not, Sam Spiegel, who is Jewish, 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 had managed to con King Hussein of Jordan into allowing <laughs> An actor, an English actor, could quote from the Quran. Now, to do this, I mean, this is an enormous con. I mean, it's an enormous uh, coup to do, to get this, you know, to enable this thing to happen. And, but providing there was a priest there who knew English and could tell if the Quran was misquoted, which it was never been, uh, it, everything was okay. Now, the scene was that um, Peter came into the tent with Anthony Quayle and they sat down. And Peter was having this terrible bout of giggles because a dear old actor, God rest his soul, who's passed by now, Henry Oscar, was playing Selim. This is a story told by Peter O'Toole to me. Um, was, for, couldn't remember the Quran, you see. I mean, there's masses of it. And he was quoting a section called The Brightness. And Alex said, Ah, oh, welcome, Orans, Orans, Orans. Welcome to my tent. <laughs> Sit down. We're just in time to hear Selim quote from The Brightness. Salim, give us the brightness. <laughs> now, this had happened several times, and Henry Oscar couldn't remember the brightness, you see. He'd get a few words into it, but being a pro, he'd carry on. Even if he dried up, he'd keep it going. That was the main thing. That wasn't good enough for the, for, for the priest, you see. He'd say, <laughs> and uh, there would be something said around the back, and they cut, you see. And uh, Tool would get into a terrible state. And um, eventually, after 15 takes, um, Guinness, Guinness, who'd been absolutely straight all this way, Alec Guinness said, Gentlemen, gentlemen, we are all professionals, for God's sake. Let us remember we are professionals. So uh, David Lean said, Look, look, let's all cut for about 10 minutes. Let's go out, have a smoke, walk around the tent. They were in the middle of the desert with lights inside the tent, on top of the heat already. You can imagine what it was like. Henry Oscar's beard that was stuck on with spirit gum was coming off in the edges. <laughs> And he was getting very nervous by this time, you see. So they start to walk around the tent outside. And O'Toole's saying to himself, like we all do when these things happen, you know, I must not laugh, I will not laugh, I cannot laugh. It's the end of my career. If I laugh again, I'm dead. I must not laugh, I will not laugh, I cannot laugh. <laughs> Alec Guinness has another la uh, walk, you know. Alec Guinness walks like that. <laughs> He says, I hope they don't laugh. Uh, I hope they laugh. Oh, what? <laughs> so they all get inside again, you see. And, but this time they've t tatted up old uh, <laughs> Henry Oscar's beard with a bit more spirit gum. They've written a bit of Koran on each fingernail. <laughs> everywhere he looks, there's a bit of Koran, so he can't go wrong. On the table, up this fella's nose, everywhere. He <laughs> so David Lean says, Okay, let's have another go. Now, Tool said, I, am, I must not laugh, I will not laugh, you see. And he's all set. In comes with the 
condemned deal. He comes in the thing. Uh, no, no disrespect to Anthony Quayle well, at all, please. Uh, he comes in the room, and uh, Guinness says, right, says, David Lean says, action. In comes O'Toole, and Guinness says, welcome, Orans, welcome, welcome, welcome. We were just listening to Salim quoting from the Quran, from a selection called The Brightness. Please sit down with Captain Zonzo and listen. And now, and he turned around to Henry Oscar, who was all glued up and everything, and he said, and now, Salim, give us the... <laughs> Let's, let's have a look at you now in, the, in, some, in a similar situation, blowing certain sequences. We're taken uh, from, in fact, two films that you made with another ace giggler called Blake Edwards. The first is oh. shot in the dark, the other is Return of the Pink Panther. Oh, is it? Oh. I put it to you directly, Monsieur Bellon, that it was you who murdered Miguel Astas. Don't be ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry. Look, um, okay. um, I just like <laughs> 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 Doorbell from the ring. <laughs> <laughs> because I am an expert and troubleshooter, I did my business. <laughs> it is my business to know. He is Sir Charles Phantom, the notorious. No. <laughs> Funny, aren't they? It's amazing, actually, when you watch them. I mean, Blake Edwards has got about 200,000 feet of you doing that. It's, it's amazing you ever finish a film with him. We always have two weeks extra for laughs, you know. For giggling. Yeah. Yeah. It's great working with Blake. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And that was from the, the new Pink Panther movie, in fact. That, that last bit was the return of the Pink Panther. Yeah. Do you, do you feel at all, Peter, that uh, you've um, ever reached your full potential in movies? Uh, I don't know, you see, because I, I hate everything I do so much that uh, I always think, well, I've got to go one better before I die, because, I mean, you know, I don't remember by all that lot. So I always think that there's something left in me. I mean, I know there is. I know there's something sort of in here somewhere that I want to get out. Uh, I think probably do it to people like Blake, who really understand me, or Stanley Kubrick, who also understands me, who... No, it seems to what it seems to know what goes on in here. I mean, the whole bit on strange love that came out of a just an idea, the arm bit, you know. Yes. yes. Uh, it's just when you get with people who say uh, who can't communicate, um, and then you think next time round I'm going to do it, you know. Next time round I really do it. Yes. Are you going to find <clears throat> the kind of fulfillment you're looking for though in in your work? It's the only time that you're really happy is at the time that you're doing it. Not when the film comes out, when you're preparing for the film, but at the moment you're doing the take on the floor. And when you do it, and that moment comes out of you, and you've done it, and you remember that, that's why Blake keeps his outtakes, you see. That's the time when the, the achievement, the full feeling of achievement comes out. Even when you see the rushes the next day, and you think, oh, no. But nevertheless, the memory of what you did at the previous day. Living for, for the moment of creation rather than the seat captured on the on the, on yes. the celluloid. Yes, although the I, saw you the, do it. I saw the the return of the Pink Panther the other day. And I hope this doesn't sound sort of immodest or anything. 
but I think it is without doubt the funniest of all of the three Panther films, of the two Panther films we made, that's the third. Uh, I really got a great kick out of watching it, yeah. probably because I had so much fun making it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. I often wonder about you too, Peter, and finally, it must be um, the end because we've sadly run out uh, of time, that um, watching you perform, and indeed watching you tonight and the sort of whole scope of what you've done, I wonder how you would have found this kind of fulfillment that you just talked about professionally had you been of another era when films weren't invented, in fact? I mean, what might you have been then? Would you have been a, the comic actor? Would you have been the classical actor? Would you have been the vaudevillian, or, or what? Well, I don't know, you know. I always think back to what my old man said about being a road sweeper. Uh, I'm a good photographer. <laughs> I could probably earn me living as a photographer. Yeah. I actually, you know, I'm turned pro now, you know, I can, you know, I do quite a lot of jobs yeah, as a photographer. Yeah. But, um, honestly, Mike, I don't really know what I'd have done. Because, it, because my mother forced me, forced me to go forward, you know. I'd have probably ended up as a road sweeper, <laughs> doing impressions of George Formby or something. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you would have gone on the boards, actually, wouldn't you? I mean, that was, I mean, that's the kind of... I know that this is another thing we share in common, apart from love of the movies. I mean, you know, we'll talk about movies forever. Forever, yeah. Right, but yeah. um, also, it's, it's a love of those people, that era of people who used to go around the halls and things, which... which yeah, sounded, sounded absolutely, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all that whole thing, you know. Yeah, and I know that, that, in fact, tonight, what I want you to do to close, if you would, please, is to do your little bit of uh, George Farnby. No, is, is that right? Well, it turned out nice again, didn't it? Aye, you know, <laughs> something like that. That'd be nice. That's, that's going back a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Do you admire him particularly? Yeah, I think he was a terrific performer. He used to make masses of movies, you remember? Oh, yeah. One a day. One a day. <laughs> Where they were all down at Shepherd's uh, thing, Lime Grove, weren't they? They used to do them down there. They used to do them in Manchester as well, Mancunian films. Right, Mancunian films. Right. What was that guy? Oh, I can't remember the fellow's name. But he used to... Um, oh, you know. Oh, I, I, it doesn't matter. Doesn't anyway, matter but it was it, that shot in, the, in what's now the BBC studio in Manchester. Yeah. They used to turn out one George Formby film on Monday, or Mother Riley on Tuesday, and Frank Randall on Wednesday. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's true. Marvelous. But they were great, weren't they? Ah, they were great movies, yeah, you know. Great, yeah. And um, at those days, we didn't have the critics who said, I don't know that there was something sort of lacking in the sort of cosmic quality about Formby's playing. <laughs> I noticed that he didn't use the wooden leg, which he used in uh, Lego Wood and um, that he'd made previously for Antonio Arce, uh, from the Italian film of the same name. I think it's going to be showing the Studio 58 <laughs> quite shortly. I mean, there weren't those critics around in those days. No, People good. used to say, really awful, or all right, you know. Uh, <laughs> let's have a reminder of it. Let's have the old still form me. Let me give you yeah. your, your uke. You. What yeah. you going to do? Well, um, I think... <laughs> Take longer to tune up than Ravi Shankar, I might tell you. <laughs> what about when I'm cleaning windows? Why not? Hmm? And why not? And why, and why not? not? Why not? In the manner of George Ford. <laughs> Turned out nice again, didn't it? <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> now I go cleaning windows. For a nosy parker, it's an interesting job. Now it's a job that just suits me. A window cleaner you would be if you could see what I can see when I'm cleaning windows. Honeymooning couples too. You should see the bill and coo. You'd be surprised the things they do when I'm cleaning windows. In my profession, I work hard, but I'll never stop. Climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top. Now the blushing bride, she looks divine. The bridegroom, he is doing fine. I'd rather have his job than mine when I'm cleaning windows. Chambermaid, sweet names I call. It's a wonder I don't fall. My mind's not on me work at all when I'm cleaning windows. I know a fella such a swell. He has a thirst that's plain to tell. I've seen him drink his bath as well. 
and I'm cleaning windows. In my profession, I work hard, but I'll never stop. <laughs> I'll climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top. Pajamas laying side by side, made it night as I have spied. I've often seen what goes inside when I'm cleaning windows. Michael Parkinson's interview with Peter Sellers replaced The Rockford Files, an episode of which you can see next Saturday evening at 8.15. And tomorrow afternoon on Radio 4, there'll be one of Peter Sellers' own favourite goon shows, beginning at 12.27. BBC Two now has another collection of Saturday Night Nasties with the horror double Bill. In the first of tonight's films, Oliver Reed falls victim to The Curse of the Werewolf. Programmes for the rest of this evening here on BBC One will now be starting about 20 minutes later than shown in the Radio Times, and in 10 minutes there's another episode of Telford's Change. But now we have the news with Kenneth Gendel. <laughs> Gold for Steve Ovitt in the Olympic 800 metres. Sebastian Coe gets the silver and is unhappy about it. But all joy for Daley Thompson, Britain's other gold medalist in the decathlon. At 21, he's the youngest winner of the title for three decades. Ovid's 800 metres victory settled for a moment his intense rivalry with Coe, but it'll be renewed in the 1500 metres. Here, with the story of Britain's medals today, is our sports correspondent, Michael Blakey. The final had been built up as the race of the decade, if not the century. Ovid versus Coe. Not the best of friends, both world record holders, and they hadn't raced against each other for two years. Well, this evening in Moscow, they renewed their acquaintance. It turned out to be a race where they were both in trouble. Oh, that rarely for him. Trapped behind the bunch, and he's got to come round that lot. What will he do? Try and barge his way through as they come towards the bell, and there he goes, bursting through, getting a rough ride. 54 points.